I'm gonna get my coffee. It's it's all right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the University of the Underground, a free, pluralistic, and transnational university and charity founded in 2017 in Amsterdam. I am Naum, the head of program of I Want to Believe an investigation into religion and belief systems and how uh, they relate to the economy, to society, to politics. I would like to welcome our participants and also to any visiting participants that we have today or that are watching uh, this video. Uh, we kindly ask you for your support and uh, support us with a, with a donation to our charity. We will have a 40 minute talk followed by a Q&A of around 15 minutes with our guest lecturer. So I would like to introduce you to, to Will Allen. And I'm sure you have watched already uh, Will's work. Uh, Will started making Super 8 uh, disaster movies at the age of 13 in California. Later, he received his film degree from S SMU with honors. Uh, his unique journey after college was documented in his 2016 debut documentary, Holy Hell, which was executive produced by uh, Jared Leto and premiered in grand jury competition at the Sundance uh, Film Festival in 2016. It was brought uh, by CNN, it was bought by CNN and Netflix and earned two Critic Choice Award nominations. The New York Times said that Holy Hell was an engrossing and tense documentary. Will is an advocate for personal freedom, dedicating his time to education and self-empowerment. Uh, Will currently lives in Santa Monica, California, and still loves those disaster movies. So Will, <laughs> welcome to the Hi. university. Hi, you guys. And all yours. So I'm gonna lecture or we're gonna answer questions. Where do you wanna start? Cause I have, the questions are always so full, it carries the whole thing. Um, has everyone seen the film? If not, I can show you some clips that weren't in it eventually. Um, but I am here to help whatever, whatever works yeah. for you. I think, I mean, uh, everyone is supposed to have watched uh, the, the film. So I don't know, maybe you can give us a, a, a brief introduction and um, whenever okay. we want, we just let the questions flow. Well, you know, as far as, how's the volume, okay? It's yeah. good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think as far as your program goes, and, and I want to believe in the whole belief idea, that I think is what we want to talk about, right? Like, how does someone fall into this? And we see it happening everywhere in our society still, you know, in politics and all types of religions. Um, and it's, you know, I was just looking at some footage about narcissists, right? Because this film is really about a narcissist and the abuse that comes from narcissists to us emotionally and all levels. You know, our ex-president was a narcissist. You know, there's a sociopathic narcissist and there's narcissists. Um, but we were so young, we didn't understand that. I didn't even know what a narcissist was until I got out. I mean, I thought narcissists were like in, in you know, in love with themselves, you know, like just love looking at themselves and like mirrors. I never knew it was an illness. I never knew it was so deep, such a deep, um, you know, there's so much deception with narcissism. It hurts people, okay? So for me, um, the meditation aspect of my experience was so real and the metaphysical aspect of just me at 22, learning how to calm my mind, learning how to be quiet, learning how to be still, and we were kind of introduced to Eastern religion, right? So I was in LA and, I walked, and my sister brought me to this meeting <clears throat> with 30 people and they were all amazing. And it was about meditation and love. And it just changed my whole, um, I never heard anything like that at the time, right? So that was never, that was never a lie. That part, you know, whatever your pursuit of happiness, it's not a lie necessarily. It took us a long time to understand that he was not to be trusted and he had agendas and that he was ma manipulating us and he was controlling us. We didn't see it. It was really, or we accepted it. And that's the part I wanna talk about. Why did we accept it, right? Why did we let him tell us what to do 
and we put his opinion way higher than ours and we did, didn't trust ourselves anymore. So that's what happens when you give over your critical thinking or you give over your belief to somebody else and say, you tell me what to do. I don't know what to do. You, know, you can see what I need to do. I don't know what I need to do. So that was our, our age we were at the very beginning. We all kind of came in with that a little bit, I think, all of us a little bit, looking for guidance. Um, this is 1985. And Reagan, I don't know if you guys know, but you know, the yuppies, it's all monetary. Everything was turning into money in the 80s. And I was like, I don't want this. I want to go back to the 60s and 70s, even though I wasn't, you know, in it. I was influenced by it. So basically, it just got worse and worse as we got more committed. What happens is when you start to commit yourself to something and you start to believe you're doing the right thing, then you start to trust yourself that you're doing the right thing. And you start to negate any kind of flags and stuff like that. And it's, it's, really, it's really dangerous. It's really obvious now looking back at it, all the pitfalls, because it was, it was spiritual and you couldn't prove anything. And there was a lot of trust that had to happen. A lot of, I don't use the word belief because at the very beginning when I got there, he said, religions are based on belief. You have to believe something. Meditation is experiential. You don't have to believe it, you experience it. It's like you take an orange, we can talk about an orange, right? Or you cut it open, you eat it, and you're like, oh my God, I love this. You know, I love this orange, you know? And so we were experiencing what everyone's talking about in all the religions, we thought. And um, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, just kind of getting organic with yourself. And we, I did drugs, all, I did drugs before, you know, in college. And so by the time I got there, he also said all the drugs we're doing is looking for something that's already inside of us, right? So that all made sense to me. It was a great opportunity for me to work on myself after college and I didn't wanna make movies at the point, I was really burnt out. So it was a pit stop for me to kind of discover myself, but it became 20 years. He was such a man that he pulled us all in, somehow got us to commit to something that wasn't even my idea. I mean, I came there never thinking about God ever I mean, I was born Catholic, but I didn't think about God as an answer, right? So the word God was a terrible word for me and my sister. So we went there, we never used the word God. It was always love and meditation. So we were doing something that was revolutionary for us. It was anti-Catholic. You know, it was, it was more Eastern. It was more guru, disciple. That wasn't part of our society. So I thought, this is amazing. And this is kind of before yoga came into our communities, right? Yoga came in in the 90s, 80s and the 90s, and there's a yoga studio in every corner. At this time, there wasn't. There wasn't, there wasn't. There were no cell phones, you know, internet, right? So we really didn't have any kind of access to like, who is this person? <laughs> What's going on here? You know, we didn't have that. We were like, wow, you know, this is amazing. How did I find this, you know? Um, and because my sister brought me, that was kind of, a tricky thing too because you know you trust your sister and she didn't do anything bad she wanted to share something so we all got into it in an innocent kind of they do say that you know we used to study about cults a little bit in the group and we would see all these things about a cult like they get you when you're down and out um there's a charismatic leader and, and we would we would laugh we would say well, we have a charismatic leader and we would laugh and say that's that's exactly us but we're not a cult we're just, we're not a cult. Uh, just like QAnon people don't think they're a cult and Republicans don't think they're a cult. And they don't see putting one person above them is the cult mentality um, to surrender your, your um, opinions and support to that person. And that's why I believe, uh, I read an article about narcissists um, with our government here in America. Um, about Trump a few years ago saying like, it's easy to diagnose him as a narcissist, but it's, what about the other million people following him? Are they narcissists too? And it's called a narcissistic group mentality, which means they might not be narcissists. Like we weren't necessarily narcissists, but there's a group mentality that um, you, when you're following the leader and if he happens to be a narcissist and have narcissistic traits, you're serving that. So you protect his word, you know, you protect him, you defend him, he doesn't do anything wrong. You know, these are things because you are now a narcissistic group and he is serving your purpose. You have purpose now because of him, right? We all agree, you know, and that's how the, I think that's how they're happening with the Republicans and a lot of it's deception, right? 
So look how many lies they're told. I mean, that I think is the basis of everything. If we had a transparent group with a transparent leader and everything was about transparency, I imagine it would be different. Okay, that's the, that's the nutshell. And then, but the 20 years, oh yeah. And then of course there was abuse happening and there was coercion and fear and all this control um, and stuff that he would do to manipulate everyone, uh, not just the guys. Uh, and he, I always felt like he was doing it, trying to keep us together. So it's like this, like you start something really small, 30 people, and then all of a sudden three years later, there's like hundred people, it's more complicated all these moving parts. And if, you, if one of us goes outside the group and tells our parents or a friend, we couldn't do that because they were, he would say they'd come attack us. So we started to create isolation and separation from society and parents and friends. It was our secret. And those are ways that he would control the group so it would stay together by controlling the members. Because if one member went wild or another one went crazy or had a relationship, or it could blow up the whole thing and he could get in trouble. So these were the, unfortunately, these were like the, the, um, the undercurrent under everything was this fear of society attacking us, uh, the fear of people making us stop meditating, you know, all these things he put in our head. But looking back, it really was a wonderful way to control us. And we agreed. I mean, we were like, yeah, we have to protect ourselves. I mean, we get into this mentality that it's us and them. And again, I keep bringing it back to politics because it's never been more obvious. This us and them. And how do you, how do you, how do you bridge that? You know, how do you, how do you fix that? Okay. Um, so I made movies the whole time I was there. I, I made movies for my group for hundred people. And I had a captive audience, it was wonderful. Um, we were just regurgitating everything that we did that was so beautiful. And I showed all the beautiful stuff and made the teacher gorgeous. And we were you know, having these high experiences. And so I filmed this for you know, 20 years. And um, you know, it, it wasn't until later when I asked myself when I got out and I wanted to make a movie about this. I'm like, why am I making a movie about this? Like, why? Like, what was my motivation? Was I mad? Was I angry? What, what was it? And it was just because I was so fascinated by this subject from the very beginning, from when I was 22, I found the whole thing. I had never seen anything like it. And we, I had told the story loyally, but only one side. I'd only really documented what we wanted to see and what, what, I, what I regurgitated. And I'm like, I'm telling, I want to finish the story. I am now at the final chapter of the story. It's a long story, but this is, this is why I want to finish it because this is the truth. It's holy and it's hell. It's, 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 it's high and it's dark. You know what I mean? It's like, it's these polarities. Do they, do they, do they come together? I know, I, are they always like that? You know, is it always, or can we find something in the middle that's, you know, not damaging. And what I want to show you also is a clip that I didn't put in the film but it talks about um, narcissism. Can I play it real quick? It's just a couple minutes. Hold on, let me see if I can do this. How do I do that? Um, you need to share I, your screen. I haven't done that yet? Okay. No. Your screen, I got it, yeah, I got it. Super. Here we go. Okay, are you there? All right, let me get this out of here. Okay, here's this one, one. It's just outtakes, right? So I had to get, I had to find a dancer. So I started studying and there it was right on paper. These are the characteristics of a narcissist. These are the characteristics of a narcissistic guru. Charles Manson, Jim Jones, David Koresh, all of these people, they're narcissists, they're not psychopaths and they attract cults. And it makes sense when you think about it, because who is going to give a person who needs constant adoration and attention, who is going to give that to them? And so codependents and narcissists, they just like an abusive relationship. You see it with men and women in romantic relationships all the time. It's the quintessential abusive relationship. Getting into a cult is no different than a battered woman coming in and out of that relationship, they're exactly the same thing. 
in terms of psychologically what's going on. This is a very sick man. And the thing is, especially about a narcissist, a pathological narcissist, is the hardest to cure because they, it's always everybody else. It's never them. So I know, I feel that it would it'd be impossible for him to ever hear anything I would say to him. Hey, so that just made me think of the class because how this film kind of, even though no, not everyone would do what we did, right? But the abuse, um, a lot of people relate to that, you know, in relationships or business and all this kind of stuff where we lose our power somehow or someone's more overpowering. And, you know, how to be aware of that and how to look for that and how to, how to have boundaries. I didn't know what boundaries was. I, so I met a boyfriend after I got out of the group and he was a trauma specialist and he did yoga uh, retreats. And I went on a retreat with him and he's like, we're going to do a boundaries class. And I was like, what, what do you mean boundaries? What do you mean? It was boundaries, you know, boundaries, like our space around us and our emotional boundaries. I had no idea. I, our teacher never taught us boundaries. You know, we never learned boundaries. We were supposed to be completely open, like no boundaries, right? And so when I learned about boundaries, I was like, wow, this is like such an important thing. This, you know, you, you, everyone has to learn this if you don't already know it. It's like you're right to say no and to have boundaries. And so as soon as I learned that, um, he would joke and say, you know, Will's using you know, his boundaries against me. Because <laughs> I would tell him no <laughs> if he wanted something. I mean, ah, that doesn't sound good. He goes, wow, you're using your boundaries against me. And it was a joke. But that's how you should be in a good, healthy relationship. It, 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 you just, you know, it's mutual consent and it's honesty and transparency. And um, boundaries are a good thing. But spiritually, they're, or you, you know, they're, they're, they're considered in the way sometimes of getting past your ego. Hmm. So any questions or what else do you want to know? I mean, we can definitely open up the question round if you're all okay with that. I can talk about anything. It's just a matter of what might be interesting. <laughs> um, so the first question came from Jessica. I think she might be away from screen. So Kayla? Um, I was just curious how your pra your practice with film has changed since, like, I like if you view people differently because in those clips in the movie it was it was like this very positive thing, and I'm just curious if that has changed at all since. Um, towards my friends or towards those people? Uh, just in general, like if you if you are still if you are still um, filming people in in that in that kind of way. And then if you view people differently, like maybe with more cynicism or, um, or still with that same kind of positivity. Um, <clears throat> I definitely have compassion and love for everybody. That's one thing I, 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 I somehow I have it. And so I don't, I don't, um, I love filming people. I'm not working on, on cult stuff right now. So I don't, I'm not going, I will be soon. Next year, I'm gonna be going back in seeing how everyone's been healing over the last 10 years and kind of go into that. And at that point, the only thing I don't have patience for is when people still haven't done their work and they might wanna defend him or, or try to explain him. It's just like so aggravating for me. It's fascinating. But it's like that woman who was on earlier, she was talking about, she doesn't try to talk to her fundamentalist friends because they're not gonna hear her. And just like what Radia said, you know, so talking to some people who still, well, he didn't mean that. And, oh, but it didn't happen to me. And, oh, but, you know, but still so much good happened. Well, that's what we said the whole time. That's what kept us there. That's what keeps you in a, in a bad relationship is you don't wanna let go of the good stuff. And you're like, well, this good stuff. Who's going to love me like this? Who's going to give me this? Who's, how am I going to get this? You know, you get afraid. And so when or if I talk to someone, and I do have a friend in the group who still defends him, who is also abused by him, right? And I think it comes from him not wanting to be a victim and not wanting to say I was victimized. And, and part of our spiritual uh, nurturing was always to take responsibility for everything. So if I didn't like you, I would be like, what's wrong with me? Like, why am I having a hard time with Kayla? Or, you know, what's wrong with me? Um, and when this teacher was having sex with me, I was like, I'm supposed to be, what's wrong with me? Like, like what's, why am I not 
what he wants this to be, you know, which he was taking advantage of me, there's no consent, but it was spiritually confusing. And so for many, many years, everybody just kinds of, um, they kind of um, take responsibility for themselves. So when that happens now, I see that as a really bad reflex, a really negative reflex. So at one point I was on CNN and, and, and someone said, you need to go to the FBI. And I was like, oh, I got so scared. And I called Ben, who was like the very first disciple ever before I got there. He was like five years before me. I go, Ben, I go, I'm just like, this is like years ago. This is like 2015. I go, they're thinking I should call the FBI and I got to call the FBI and I should report. We haven't, I go, I feel so weird. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to, I'm not an activist. Like, I don't want to go after someone, you know what I mean? And he's really wise. And he goes, he goes, that is what Andreas taught us is to protect him. He taught us to protect him and never to hurt him because he's like this little baby, delicate child that needs to be protected from the world. And so that was how deep it is. It comes up like, I don't even want to attack somebody or him because it's just not my personality. But he pointed out that we're trained um, also to, by a narcissist to protect him. I mean, look at our government. I mean, so you have to kind of get out of that training and say, no, this is the right thing to do. And so making holy hell was really an ethical choice. Um, it was something that just needed to happen because I wanted to finish what I started, which was filming in, when I was 22. And then I just, wow, I hear it all was. It was all very invisible though, because I never captured any of the yelling, screaming, abuse. You don't capture that because the camera goes off. So I had to use all the footage and then suppose and, and, and superimpose everybody's reality on this really other footage, which showed the contradiction. And when I started making the film, I started using people's voices and merging it with the images. And someone might be saying something really creepy and cynical. And he's walking and acting really, it's a beautiful moment. And those two things went really well together because those, that is what was happening. So the voice is really married to the footage because it, it was true. There's multiple things, you know, he's, he's terrible things are going on and you don't see it on the outside. And so that's how the film, I think, got under your skin and that's how we experienced it. So I made the film in chronological and I made the film in a way that um, I didn't give it all away at the beginning, even though you can see it coming. Every time one of our interviews, like when I would be talking, like, oh yeah, when I first got there, I thought he was, I thought he was really weird looking and I don't know. I would take all that stuff out because it didn't help us move the story forward because well, you still stayed. So now you have hindsight, which doesn't help us. Hindsight, when you're thinking when you first saw this person doesn't help us if you still stayed. And you know, so we're just pulling that out uh, until we need to talk about it later because we stayed the whole time. So that's kind of what I did. It's kind of slow burn of a frog in a boiling water. That's what we were. We just didn't see it coming. And, you know, and that's what I wanted the film to be like a little bit um, because we don't see what's going on. I mean, again, our society is still like this. It's still like this where these people up here, God knows what's going on. And we're all down here with the trickle, with the information, just what we get to know. So, you know, how does that change? How do we get narcissists out of our society or these, these people who don't have the um, humanitarian empathy thing? Well, that's not true. That's not, I, I don't think that's so. I don't know if that's true if they don't have. I know they don't have empathy, but I, I, they can act humanitarian. You know, they can act. And also really interesting about narcissists I learned is that they absolutely do not want to get caught. And exposing a narcissist is the best way you can do catch them because they will disappear, they will flee, they will hide. They don't want to go to jail. They never want to get punished for what they're doing. So they'll have no integrity of doing whatever it takes to get out or put someone else under the bus. Trump, again, I mean, I hate to say that, but it's just so obvious. Um, yeah. So I have learned to notice narcissists. I have to answer your question earlier. Um, I am a little bit cynical of religions, anything organized. I can see it a mile away, even if it's a lovely group of people. I'm like, wow, I wouldn't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole because I know how complicated it is. I know all the egos involved. I know all the different personalities. And they're all trying to function as one. It's so complicated. So I see that a mile away, and I just want to nurture myself. I do miss others like-minded people, and I have friends like that. But we don't, I don't think you need a group mentality or, you know, yes, I work out better at the gym with other people, <laughs> but this is different. And 
don't know. I just, do you guys have any of this stuff happening where you guys are? Like where friends of yours might be seeking something more expansive, but not feeling if they know if anything's true or not, or are you guys looking into religion or, you know, I know you are, but where are you guys at? Okay, uh, I think, yeah, we can keep rolling the questions. Uh, the, sorry, the, I think Jessica would like to ask you something. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <clears throat> Will already addressed it. I was asking what his relationship to spiritual practice is now. And I was also oh, yeah. curious mm -hmm. how he feels around charismatic people oh. after. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, charismatic people, I don't, I don't, I don't look at it like that anymore, like charismatic or personality, but I do look at controlling and those keywords when someone's like controlling someone. And I don't think they even know they're doing it. So I can see that kind of stuff. Um, but spiritually, I've really had to reprogram my whole idea because meditation isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I don't want to do it anymore. Right. I did it like a soldier for so many years. I, I, I have an aversion to like PTSD, which is not good to have PTSD on, on, a, on, a, on a place that's kind of healing for you, right? Like you don't want to go there to heal, but it, it is where you should go maybe to kind of you know, heal. Um, but yeah, over the last 10 years, I've been doing a lot of different um, practices of my own, things that I love, things that I, are really important to me. And when I meditate now, um, it's not just to be quiet or, or to be devotional, you know, or to like, surrender it's to listen to myself and to hear what i what i'm trying to tell myself and where i'm going to go next and what i want to do next and so i use that quietness as, as a pond to try to see myself right and where i want to go next but that's not how it was for me back when i was 20 and 30 it was like you meditate you have no future it's all right here right so i use it as a creative tool i use it as a evolutionary uh personal personal tool and um, I love things that are non-dogmatic I can't stand anything with he she any religion I really I really don't this is so obviously disprovable okay uh Ruth sharing so far um yeah, I wanted to say, first of all, that I kind of got involved with like a Kundalini yoga cult for for a while. And, you know, at the beginning, it was amazing because it was like helping me um, out of depression, for example. And it was like the best thing I'd ever discovered. And then, you know, like we started to be like little indicators and the teacher would say things like, uh, if you leave, it's your subconscious uh, telling you that that, uh, that you want to leave as opposed to it being like yeah actually <laughs> this this whole thing is is a, is a sham and and uh, yeah there was like sexual abuse going on um in the city was this um they were based in between la and new york oh, yeah. rama yeah. i don't know if you've heard yeah 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 i've done you know a few years ago while i was making holy hell i did go a friend of mine gave me her extra kundalini classes right and so yeah. i went and I, I, I had never done Kundalini, you know, that's all the breath, like you know, yeah. all, it's not so much the poses, it's more like really working with the breath, right? And I loved it um, because it helped me be creative. Like I was just talking about, it helped me unblock my mind, right? Yeah. Um, but they were all Sikhs, they were all, you know, in turbans and they were all from the Sikh tradition and slowly but surely, I was just like, they're like, our teacher's coming this week and come into this and they just want to pull you in and deeper and deeper, which, is beautiful for them because they think we all want the same thing, right? They think they're doing service. Yeah. But nobody should be telling you and giving you advice about what to do, <laughs> you know? Sure. So, but go ahead. Yeah, no, my question then was like, what was the turning point for you that you knew that you wanted to leave? Like what gave you the courage to leave after after 20 years? <sighs> That's a good question. Um, I didn't understand it until, I, I, until it hit me. Um, I was really loyal. I'm a very loyal person. And this teacher had us make vows and promises, which I really took seriously. Like, you know, when I was in my twenties, like, you know, he'll give me this experience of God if I promise to stay with him and do the work and never leave, you know, this kind of thing. I was like, well, yeah, this is God. Of course I want this. Um, but what was your question? Remind me. 
uh, what gave you the courage or what was the turning yeah. point? And so know? I was really, so because he pulled me out of the group, and put me into an inner circle role where I was body worker and I drove him and I was always with him for like 15 years. And I got kind of isolated from my friends. I wasn't with my friends, but I was serving the group. So he convinced me that, that without him, the Republican party, I mean, the group won't exist. And so everyone's coming to see him. So me helping him get his body well and dance, you know, all these things was helping the group. So I was doing a service for everybody to keep the group together, right? So here it goes, 20 years go by and we're still in this idea that, you know, we have to stay together because, you know, we're a family kind of mentality. And when the group started to fall apart, like at the end of the film, um, and half of my friends went one way and half of them went the other way. And I was stuck in the middle because I was so connected to him. I didn't know what to do. And so I went with him to Hawaii, but it wasn't until I got to Hawaii um, that I realized I was only there for my friends. I was there for my friends. I was there because I thought I was helping them. And when they were leaving, I didn't have to be there anymore. It was like the key, the door broke the, and my lock and my lock and key broke. And I was like, I, I'm serving my friends. I was serving the group. I wasn't really serving you. You know, I don't even, I haven't liked you for, for 15 years, but I've been serving the group. So it took me a long time to break that idea that I was going against myself if I left or I was breaking a promise and I was choosing something lower. And someone said, yeah, uh, if you left the group and you have an airplane crash, I mean, he would tell people this, you're gonna crash, everybody gets into drugs, everybody falls down. It's like all downhill if you leave. Um, and you'd see it happen with some people who left, they get lost and confused because it was so damaging. You know, if you're so confused afterwards, of course they're seeking some sort of comfort. Um, but yeah, it was, um, I really finally realized I have nothing to do here anymore. I'm not certain, there's no group. I don't have to serve it. Kind of sad, I wish I knew that earlier. I wish I was stronger, but I was just, you know. All right, then uh, who's next? Uh, Jamal. Jamal. Okay, so yes, you're there. I think now your connection is betraying you. Yeah, uh, let go with we, another. Yes, go ahead. Okay, I think there is a problem with Jamal's connection, so maybe we can try uh, afterwards. So let's go with Francisco. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I have two questions actually. One is that uh, in the movie towards the end, uh, when you go back to uh, Hawaii, it seems like you were. Uh, looking to confront Andreas, mm -hmm. like to tell him what a shitty person he was, but it seemed like you, you know, were held back from doing it. That. So what, what was going through your mind? I was wondering. And the second question is, uh, what advice would you give to people that know somebody who is in a cult right now in order to, you know, to make them aware, to yeah. work yeah. something out towards uh, liberating yeah. from them? Mm -hmm. It's a tough one. That's like taking a bone away from a dog, but you know, there's a lot of things you can do. Um, what was happening for me, I shot that. So you have to understand, I was making this movie privately. Like I could not let him know I was making it. The only people who know I was making it were my friends who were in it. And it was, a t he would have come after me. He, we were, I was afraid for like two years that he would find out and come and you know, steal everything in my apartment. So um, when I went there with my cinematographer, I was going there undercover to shoot him and to get as much footage as I can of what they're doing, what the group was doing now. And I had a tracking device that I put on his car because we knew where he lived. And I go at four o'clock in the morning, I put this big tracking device on his car. <sighs> My heart was like, <gasps> blah, blah, blah. I was so scared because it felt so illegal. But I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna track this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna make this movie. I'm gonna show this guy. So we wanted to follow him. So we had this tracking device and I had all these cameras that were like, um, the camera was right here, you know? And so I had sunglasses. I had, I had this whole thing planned out for years. It was gonna be my big final shot. And I was going to go up to him because he still trusted me. So he had to trust me. I never kind of betrayed, I never told him to fuck off yet. 
So I was there and my plan was to run into her on the beach and be kind of wet and say, hey, what's going on? Let's go over here and talk. And we were gonna, um, I was gonna get him lying to me, just lying right to my face, just to, so the audience can see what it looks like to be in front of him. And what happened was that day was my last day there and none of my cameras were working on my, on my none of them were working. And uh, we were all trying to call the play, you know, it was, all, it was really hard to work it like this, like they're very complicated. So all of a sudden his car starts moving and we're like, they're like, he's moving, he's going, he's on his, he's, I go, we gotta go. So we jump in the car, we're, we're tracking him and, and he ends up at the beach, right? And he goes, he goes to the beach, he goes swimming, he drives off and he leaves. So it's like a 30 minute window. And I get there to the beach, we see them and, and Polly's gonna go hide over there and film them. And I'm, I go, I don't wanna go in there. I don't really wanna do this. I wasn't going there to confront him because there's, like Roddy has said, you can't confront him. It's just ridiculous. You know, you look like an idiot. Um, so no, I wasn't gonna go confront him. I was going to capture him, which is different. And so, um, but my camera wasn't, my camera wasn't working. I said, I go, she goes, Will, just use your iPhone. I go, what? I go, no. She goes, yeah, put it in your pocket. Just leave it that. I go, are you kidding? I go, I don't want that shot. I don't want a shot like, you know, vertical. I go, I want it horizontal. And I go, I want it to be, because I'm a filmmaker and I want it to be right. And she goes, well, just, just put it, just put it here then. I'm like, okay. So I, I cut a hole in my shirt. I put my camera right here, right? In a hole. And I went to the store, taped it, and I went in, and I was so nervous. And I had another friend helping me, and he was coming out of the water. And we just, we jerry-rigged this thing. And I just went. And I was, I go, this isn't what I want to do. This isn't the shot I want. I'm not going to capture what I want. I don't want to be here. Um, and so when I walked up to him, the first thing he did was, look, he looked at me like this, and he went, uh huh. And he looked like right. He looked right at my camera, right, which is so obvious. I was like so at a disadvantage. I felt so exposed. I felt so like um, now he knows I'm making a movie. Now he doesn't trust me. Now I'm never going to get the conversation. Now I'm, it's all blown, right? And so when I got there, and everyone wanted to hug me, these people, some of them knew me, and they wanted to hug me, and I was like, oh, don't, don't hug me too much. You know, I, I've got a camera right here. So I just want to get out of there. So I thought to myself in that moment, I go, no one's going to ever see this footage. Just get out of here. Um, just, just whatever you have to say, just get out. Just get out of here. And I just said as much as, as little as I could. One thing I said is like, are you being a good boy? I said, you know, and he's like, oh, what's a good boy? What's good and bad? Typical, right? Oh yeah, there is no, it's all perception. Okay, well, you know what good is. You know, I, I said something to him. He goes, best, better to be better or best. I'm like, oh God. So he avoids the question. I leave. I leave. And they had confronted Polly. Polly was my cinematographer and she was over by the, you know, hiding behind a wall. And some guy comes up and goes, what are you doing? My film, my friends don't like to be filmed. And she goes, oh, I'm not filming them. I'm filming people behind them. He goes, well, they don't like to be filmed. We used to say that to people. So no one would catch our image, right? And she stopped filming because she was afraid of them. And she stopped and, you know, I get back to the car and I go, God, that was terrible. And she goes, I know they came after me and I, I stopped filming. I'm like, you stopped filming, why? But so that's all the footage we had. And I thought to myself, while I was making the film, I'm going back to do my final shot because he doesn't know I'm making a movie yet. So I'm still going to go back and I'm going to do my glasses. I'm going to say hi. And I edited, if I got what I wanted, I edited a scene of the film. Like, what if I got what I wanted? What, what do I want him to say? What, what, what's he going to say, right? I go, this isn't an ending. I don't need him as an ending. I don't want to hear him talk even. I don't want, to want, want him to explain anything, you know? So I just, I realized that I had to use that footage um, because it's so unresolvable. And that footage really captured it being unresolvable and the frustration of trying to stop someone or confront someone like this who basically doesn't acknowledge it, you know? It just makes you look insane. So, and none of my friends are insane and we just don't want to give him the, the air to uh, confront him, I guess. But this movie is much bigger, a bigger confrontation for him than, than me yelling at him. So I know, I ha so, so Kyla, no, what, what's your name, Tutti Frutti? Oh, Francisco. Um, so Francisco, I, uh, I had a lot of people say, we'd, have, we'd show it at Sundance and Festival all over, like, I wanted to beat, I thought you were gonna hit him. Why didn't you hit him? I was like, well, it's like the last thing I would have done, you know? But the movie makes you feel like that. And the movie gets you all worked up into that moment. 
but it was much more complicated and life isn't always like that. And I'm not that person. So, but it's interesting how it worked out. And I really, and so here's the other thing. So the, so the shot of him, which is interesting, it was like this, right? And it ended up being like, like his eye was like, his face was up here in the corner. And I was like, this is exactly what I didn't want. This is exactly, it's a palm tree. It's a palm tree and, and, and his face, you know? But um, I really loved it. I really loved it eventually. And when I'd show it in a theater, like a big pack theater, you see the whole audience looking up in the right corner of the theater, just looking at his eyeball, right? Just like fixed. And I was like, wow, look at that. I just took all their eyes and all their eyes went up there. So the shot just worked re regardless of me. And that's how that worked. But I had to answer that question a lot. People didn't understand why I didn't confront him and what was going on. And this is not real time. You know, I shot that two years before the movie came out, a year before the movie came out. All right, I think Jamal is back. Let's try. Yes, exactly. Thank you very much. Where'd you go, Jamal? Where'd you go? Yes, uh, the internet as, as usual. So, well, thank you th so much for, for sharing all these insights and being so honest. Uh, I have to be honest, I saw the film two years ago and the first time I saw it, uh, I was sweating. I was really, really <laughs> intense. And I was sharing it with uh, all my friends and said, look at this movie, like literally holy hell, because the story arc was, was tremendous. So I would have two questions, like first rather technical, like how the editing process was like for you and like to work in a, in a, in a, with such a personal topic and with a team of editors. And then the second one would be like, how did you feel with having some maybe even yeah, irrational fears of, of sharing this point of vulnerability with, with the world? Because you, you, were, you already I'll said- take, I'll, take, I'll take that question first. And this is a really yes, good please. thing for all of us to kind of understand. I had been all about truth anyhow. I, I thought I was truthful, right? So um, when I got out of the group, I had sacrificed my whole life for this. And so I really had nothing to lose. I didn't have a career. I, I chose not to have a career. I said, fuck that. I don't need an Oscar. You know, this is my 20s and my 30s. I just did this whole other thing, which was lovely on so many levels. But I didn't have a career. So I, I remember when I got out of this, I'm like, you know, I'm going to tell the story. And I don't fucking care what people think about me. I don't care. They don't know me. And, and the other thing that was really interesting when I started to make the movie, I thought, well, how am I going to make this movie? Nobody knows any of me. Nobody knows any of us. Why they're gonna, they'd rather see a movie with Katy Perry or Tom Cruise, you know, you know, this is a documentary. So I'm like, well, this is, has to be personal. So it was hard to do it personally. I would call my lawyer, who is an entertainment lawyer, and I'd constantly say, I'm having this moral dilemma. I'm having this moral dilemma. He goes, Will, it's an ethical dilemma. It's not a moral, it's ethical. I go, what do you mean? So he'd explain to me, you know, the choice, well, am I gonna show this person uh, like some of the people around him. So I took all the boys out who were abused. None of the boys are in the film. I protected so many people, you know, and so that was my choice. I had to keep going, I'm not gonna show her. I'm not gonna show him. It's gonna really hurt them. Uh, it makes me sad to think that. But um, so yeah, I protected them, but I didn't have anything to lose myself. And I feel like being honest about it. I mean, this isn't a subject Oprah hasn't talked about. It's not like reality television hasn't talked about everything already. So what am I doing? I'm just adding something that's I think valuable. And I also believe we can't learn from each other unless we're honest. How, how, how do we learn from each other if we don't tell the truth? And what are we doing if we're all gathering information, right? We're all gathering truth to share with each other. So to me, the movie was a service. Like it was, it was a, I'm gonna give this out, but I didn't know what the movie was gonna be about. For the first couple of years, it was like, what is the story? What is the story? What is the story? You know, whose story? What is, I did you had to have the story. And I was like, this is just more about, you know, an arc. Uh, you know, it's my story, his story, and all of our stories. It's complicated to make it like one story. So it did become a story about the group. Um, and I was layered in there to help get us through it, right? To help tell it. But I wasn't, um, and I was part of all of it. But um, so, and editing was really actually very fun. I had so much material 
and I had so many good interviews. I would just parse down the best interviews. I'd section everything out. I did this amazing, I'm very organized when I do stuff. I'm very like, you know, perfectionist. So then when I finally hired an editor to work with me, I got this Oscar winning editor who did Hoop Dreams back in the eighties. It was the only documentary ever won an Oscar for editing. And um, I got him interested in my film and I wanted him, I wanted a name like that. I wanted someone to have my back. Like I didn't trust myself to tell my story because I'm like so close to it. So I, thought, I don't want to make a fool of myself either. I want someone to make sure you know, don't make a fool of yourself. So, because um, creatively you take chances and you can make mistakes. So, um, but he didn't work out, you know? I brought him in, in, in and I was going to get a junior editor, someone like Jamal's age, who um, just is eager and excited and work 20 hours a day and would, you know, give everything for it. And so I found a junior editor who had just graduated from, uh, who graduated, he was 30, and he had graduated from uh, SMU at USC. But when I interviewed him, he said um, his mother was a psychologist, his father was a psychiatrist. And I said, you're hired. <laughs> you're hired. You know, that's all I want is someone smart who can get into this with me and, and help tell the story. So we had this Oscar winner that really did nothing and I didn't use him. And I basically, it's just me and my junior editor edited it and he was so good and he learned how to do my style that, and he would imitate my stuff that I already cut, that he became my, my editor. So, I mean, my, my co-editor. So we both just became editors and I never even used the other guy. Although I gave him credit, you know, for su supervising because his name, no, I was just kidding. But I was really happy that he was part of it for a while, you know, and I, I had to give him credit. So I gave some people that supervising editors, you know, but they didn't really do much. It really was up to me. And then we did have a team of editors. Once we got into Sundance, we got closer to the deadline and we had like two months to do four months of editing, I think. I did have people come in and my this apartment had a computer there, someone doing the finishing editing, someone over here, fine tuning my scenes and cutting things and me over here and someone in the kitchen. And we had like a whole team in here working for the last month. No way I could have done it by myself because it's too. And when you have a deadline like that, I mean, I could have done it by myself over time, but when you have a deadline uh, for Sundance and they're already having, you're already uh, on the brochures and it's already like, you know, it's already, they already put money into it. You can't fuck it up. And so the other thing that's really interesting, so I showed it at Sundance and I was really burnt out. I was so burnt out. My adrenals were gone. I had no sleep. I do three days, three days without sleep. I was emotional and I did interviews every day and movies, it was just exhausting. And I remember saying to my producer going, God, I'm just so unhappy, this is not my film. I'm, I, I, I didn't get to finish it. She goes, Will, almost 95% of the films that come into Sundance aren't finished yet. They're just getting there for the deadline and you 95% of them still go back and they, they, they toil with it. So just relax, listen to the audience, take notes. If something sticks out you don't like, just make a note, we'll go back and, and fix it. Okay, so I did. I took a month off after Sundance, I was tired. And then I took seven weeks and I went right back into the editing room and did a major, major edit on it. Um, I had animated pieces, little pieces between like 12 of them. I took them all out and I had to create new bridges because those were kind of like support systems, like almost a script, like almost like marks of the script. It was an animated motion scene, what was going on with me. But anything that was just taking, taking us out of the story or anything, I just kind of, you know, pulled it out and I restructured it. And then we remixed it. And then we had a, that was right before our May um, international premiere. We had, we, we, it showed in movie theaters in California and New York for two weeks, right? So this was the cut they saw. And this is the cut CNN got, this is the cut everyone got. So my cut from Sundance is like, no one sees that cut. Even though it's good, it's just, I can't, it's just not perfect, you know, it's like, ugh. <laughs> So, but some people liked it more. Like I had friends of mine who were at Sundance and then they saw my next one and they're like, what did you do to it? It's not as emotional. I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, the other one's just like, oh my God, devastating. I'm like, well, I don't know. I didn't, I don't know what to tell you. It's, I had to change it. And so, so some people like that other version, but yeah, it was an interesting experience. Editing was hard. Um, and, and using my voice as voiceover was a big, big de decision. I didn't want to do that. And I was like, I don't even like voiceover in movies, really, unless they know how to do it without sounding like they're reading, right? And I just got, I finally just experimented and experimented and realized I had to. 
explain why you're watching this footage and whose footage it is. It's my footage and here's my story and my family was actually in it, you know, so I guess I'm, I guess I am part of it. I guess I will expose myself, even though I like being behind the camera. As a filmmaker, I like being behind the camera. And that's what I did for 20 years. I just like hide behind the camera. You know, it's a way of hiding uh, and not having to be fully involved and being involved in a different way. But I think that saved me from being too hurt in the group because I always had this objective point of view I would be filming from my lens. And I, I, I so when I watched that footage, you know, 15 years before, I remember what I was thinking. So it's all very journalistic for me. So when I document things, maybe all of you guys, when you film things, it's a journal for you, right? And you kind of remember what you're doing that day, what you're feeling and, and the dichotomies of all that. And so my footage brought all that up for me. Um, and so it was a hard. They say when you're injured, you know, you don't want to go into your injury. You kind of want to move past it and create new memories and don't re-traumatize yourself. Well, I kind of re-traumatized myself a little bit by going back into it so hard. Um, and it's sort of a lot of people. Yeah, but it's the way it's supposed to be. It's, I, think, oh. I think you guys are more important. I used to say, um, I don't, you know, our group did this. We need to be honest about it. Let's talk about it. We were all, always thought we were doing good for the planet. We always thought we were raising the consciousness. Well, you know what? If that's what we thought, then if you're not in on this film, then fuck you. I'm sorry, because you're just, you're not, you're not helping heal this problem that you created. And there are some people who came before me in this group who sued me, who tried to sue me. They couldn't sue me. They tried to sue me for not putting some footage in there. Um, and this was a girl who started the group in Florida and she was like the main girl. And so on so many emotional levels, you're like, wow, are you ever gonna take responsibility for all the shit you did? Are you ever going to take responsibility and say, I'm sorry? to all of us or something. And, and she wouldn't even help with the film. So those kind of people, I'm just like, wow, we are just not the same on the same page because you're selfish <laughs> and you're being selfish and you're, you're, you're doing what we did for seven, for, for 10 years, just protecting ourselves like, like this, like we're like, it's like, this is a big world. It's a big pond and you know, we're in an ocean and not all of us grew out of that mentality of, hiding and being isolated and and not part of the world all right um mm -hmm. we have five minutes left i'm trying to answer quick I'm sorry. and uh, okay let, let, let's try to put together a g's question and teresa question so g would you like to ask uh yeah hi um my question was basically like especially at the beginning of the film you do describe some really beautiful moments with the group and as part of the whole yeah the group together and it seems quite positive so my question is do you think that a cult could ever be a positive experience i do i do i, I still think it's hard it's think of it like a subculture like cults are like a subculture right so it's a small culture I went to Domenher, which is in Italy. I went after I left the group. And it is a sustainable, I don't want to use the word cult, alternative religious, but they embrace all religions. They have no leader. And I was going to use them as an example because I'm like, why make this movie and then not have an example of how would you do it different or how, you know, how, how can this be done without abuse? And they have no teacher. And they have a democracy and they all change roles and they all, you know, they all govern themselves. And so the UN is actually studying them. So yeah, I think it's possible. I think it's really not possible if one person's in charge. I just don't think it's possible. Um, that's just off the cuff. You asked me another question. Uh, yes, Teresa. Yeah. Hi. Um... Shakti. The Shakti was real. I mean, not, not his Shakti, but just the, if you meditate a lot, you start getting kind of intoxicated. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks for being so open. It's been, it's really empowering. And uh, my question was actually like, if you think that uh, he would be, an, that he would have to be a certain kind of personality to, for him to be able to manipulate you or if he was able to manipulate anybody, like you described yourself as loyal and open and boundaryless at some point, but you didn't know what boundaries were. And then also what were the strongest emotions that you felt afterwards? Like I kind of imagined like, did you ever feel guilt or did you ever feel like, yeah, like 
kind of the trauma yeah. that you had to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, for, we all felt like failures. I mean, me and my closest friends, when this whole thing happened, we just didn't see it coming. And we just, and all the lot, all the truth came out between us. We all felt like we just failed and wasted our life, you know? Um, so, but the guilt for me, if I had guilt, well, first of all, I, I thought he was a genius. I mean, I do think that there's something about him that is gifted. Um, he can memorize, he was an actor, he was a dancer, he was a hypnotherapist, um, he was a counselor, like a pr priest type thing. So he had a gift, he'd read a lot. And they say readers are leaders, right? He read constantly. So he would just regurgitate that to us. And I don't know where his manipulative skills came in other than he would just see like a game of chess, he would see it like five pieces ahead. And I would think, okay, well, that's just, I mean, um, but yeah, I felt, you know, so I made the movie and we showed it to someone who was really high at USC in, I don't know, I don't remember his name, but my, my lawyer said, why don't we show this to him and see if he has anything to say? Because my lawyer had a lot of power and to get to this guy was, was hard. And so the comment he gave me was, well, you didn't really talk about your responsibility with this. You didn't talk about how you feel about you doing all this. And I thought, well, you're right. And so I added a whole section in the film. It was right before the confrontation at the beach. And I said, if you look at it, that's what I added to try to get in there, like my responsibility for making this, making him and supporting him and just being a part of making him, I thought I was telling the truth, but I was really making him bigger and more powerful by my films too, and convincing people by my conviction. So I kind of took responsibility for that in the film. Um, in my everyday life guilt, I want to say no, other than feeling like I failed something. Because we all, me and my good friends who I trust, we said we all did the best we could and we all have amnesty. There are people who did a lot of harm to other people, but they were all in a really artificial situation with not all the information, almost unnatural. So everyone did the best they could and we forgive everybody. Because I mean, yeah, it, it's like the thing of like you, you are not the abuser, and why should you? But I that's why I'm asking about that because of like you compared yeah. it to the abusive relationship as well. And um, you want to hear where my guilt comes in, honestly? It's it's part of that other deep programming that I feel like I betrayed somebody, right? Mm, like yeah. I feel like I threw someone under the bus, like I, I, I literally, and I was like, this is the person who gave me a lot, he, you know, he loved me, we loved each other, we all loved each other you know, at certain degrees, right? It's not all dark. And I felt um, that was a really hard for me to come strong and say, this is what's right. And I need to talk, we need to talk about what you did. And, you know, and then my feelings started coming up. The problem with some of this abuse is it didn't register as abuse. That's what Chris said, the guy you saw earlier who's straight. He's like, it didn't register as abuse because he convinced us we were doing something that we needed to do and it was divine and all this kind of stuff. So even a straight guy got into a five-year thing with him, thinking it was for his own good. So, but yeah, I do feel, I sometimes feel bad that I'll think like, oh, he thought he was doing good. Like he doesn't see this, you know, he doesn't know what he is, you know? I sometimes think that. But other than that, I mean, guilt. Guilt's not really helpful. But, and also the first part, do you think that he would be able to do that to anybody or you have to be? Well, he, he thinks he can. He thinks he's Jesus. I mean, I think he does. So when I left him in Hawaii, he walked down the beach. There's this woman coming towards us who he already knew was like a spiritual woman. She used to be Miss New York and she was Hawaiian. And he's like, he was planning to encounter her because he wants her to be his disciple. And this is when I was leaving. I was leaving and she was walking up the beach and he's like, hello, hello. Mm, good to meet you again. So he says this all this little past life bullshit. And I'm looking at him and she's like, hi. And she had no clue what he was pulling on her. He was trying to like, look into my eyes, look into my eyes. And we're like, and she walked away with her dogs and he goes, she wasn't ready to see me yet. So I'm like, oh my God. And I looked at her, I go, what makes you think she's supposed to see you? What makes you think that you're supposed to help her? It's just this fucking insane. And that's when I was like, you're just off the hook, insane, Jesus complex. You, know, you think you're here to, I don't know. 
So yeah, I think he can convince people. So even after the film came out, he has new disciples who've seen the film. Okay, so obviously he pranced around Hawaii after the film came out, taking credit for the good part, saying the other stuff was a lie, right? And I, I used to laugh, say, yeah, he'll take credit for the first part of the movie, you know, because that was like, oh, that's true. <laughs> but the second half's not true, right? So he can still convince people. He believes it himself. He's very convincing. And he has an authority of spiritual, like, you know, I don't know. He meditates way too much. It's like, I would cut his meditation down to like 30 minutes a day. Because <laughs> he's just disconnected, you know? He's just like... But I do want to go back and visit the story again. I haven't wanted to until lately. And so I'm going to be writing about it. I'm writing a book this coming November starting. And I'm going to, I want to go back and re, re look at what's going on, the healing that came from this and what didn't heal and where we're all at and stuff. And thanks you guys for hanging out with this, this whole time. No, thank you, Will. Uh, I think uh, we all appreciate your openness to discuss uh, your 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 professional process, your personal journey, and I think for us it was very important to to have you in the program because you you bring in you know your your experience with with a cult. You are a practitioner, so you have to deal with a bunch of things around making a a, a project about this mm -hmm. and 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 sharing that personal experience with a with the participants. It's, it is is really really important and enlightening. So yeah, thanks so much for that. So welcome, you guys. Let's keep going. Whatever you're doing, keep keep doing it, and um, definitely ask questions. You know, that's just, nowadays I say if someone gets involved with something like this, it's just because they're lazy. I mean, if I get involved, like I don't want to do the work. I don't want to Google shit and look it up to find out if this thing really works or that, whatever. I'm not talking spiritual, but nowadays everything's access. So do your work. I mean, just really look, we have so much at our fingertips now. I think we can figure things out maybe better unless a personal relationship, you know, you, 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 know, you have to figure that one out slowly. Yeah. And um, yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Ruth, right. uh, for this question. Is there, if any of the participants would like to get in touch with you, what would be the best way to, to reach uh, yeah, you? Yeah, you can um, email me. I have a Facebook page called Holy Hell uh, the Documentary. Yeah. Um, but I don't check that that often, so you can email me. Okay. Could you, type your, could you type your email in the chat, please? Yeah, mm -hmm, for sure. Let me give you my you. easiest one. 405 is our our freeway here. Chanel. Yeah. And then you got the other one. There you go. Fantastic. Yeah, thanks you guys. I love, you know, anything I can do to help anyone or I mean, anything that needs to go, you know, if you guys are working on stuff, it's, you know, you want to move it forward or questions, you know, it's, it's a long process. And so every step of the way, it's great to talk to people if you need to. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for being that yeah. open. Yeah, we really appreciate it, Will. So, Let's wrap it up. Right, Thanks so much. Thank mm -hmm. Cheers. Cheers. Good night.